Happy New Year and welcome to the show. My name is Brett. If you're new to this channel, this is where we talk about everything containers and DevOps. I have people on the show almost every week and we take questions and I hopefully have answers along with my guests from this show. So get your questions in right now because we'll have an hour of chit chatting here and hopefully answering some of your questions related to the topics we're talking about. And this is a show we do every week. So make sure you subscribe, you know, that whole YouTube thing, click subscribe, like, click the button. And if there's a little dinner bell down there, that will notify you when I go live, usually on Thursdays at this time. So you can come back and learn more about Kubernetes, Docker, all these topics. And it's exciting today because I have a special guest on the show. We're gonna have a dueling Docker captain day here. So welcome to the show. Uh, Gianluca, let's see, let me make sure I get your name right. Uh, Arbizano, so Italian, and Italian is not my forte. So Gianluca and I have been friends for uh, three, four years, maybe? Like at DockerCon 2016? Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, is this, this is your first time on the show? I'm trying to remember if we yeah. did something during DockerCon a couple of years ago. Maybe maybe oh. I couldn't fit you in the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all my hair, so yeah. I had to cut them, and now I can see it. <laughs> yeah, we've had so many uh, great groups of Docker captains on the show. So if you if you've been watching this show before uh, before you've maybe seen last year we we had around DockerCon I had like a dozen different captains, and Gianluca just wasn't able to make it. So um, we will not make that mistake again. Uh, the first piece of news, though, is that, unfortunately, as Docker captains, we will no longer be at DockerCon, the the real event in the real world, because we found out recently from uh, DockerCon's Twitter handle that we're not going to have real, in-the-flesh DockerCons anymore. Kind of a bummer. That's why we are doing the live show, have the training, you know. Yeah. So, but you can come here. <laughs> <laughs> you can come here and hang out with us every week and... Uh, uh, Gianluca and I are in a captain's channel with other Docker captains, so I'm always in there asking for people to hang out on the show and see what they're up to and what they're learning uh, in the container community. And we've got tons to talk about today. So let me just give you a quick background on Gianluca. He is uh, currently in Italy and is working for Influx Data, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we, like I said, we met as Docker captains. He works on containers constantly. He's always doing uh, SRE-related stuff. Site Reliability Engineer. Is that your title, I believe? it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that involves a lot of things around keeping systems up, monitoring metrics. And this is involving Kubernetes and containers, all the things that are perfect for this show. So we could probably talk for four or five hours if we wanted to. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be late here, but let's see what we can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's gonna be. It's gonna. It's already dark there in Europe. So the problem is, is that I have this show in the afternoon, not in the mornings. So you should have a glass of wine in your hand at this point. Um, so all right. So let's talk about some of the uh, stuff. So we so we talked about DockerCon real quick. I just want to mention, by the way, that that is going to actually happen virtually. So we don't know the dates yet. I don't think the dates are out yet. Are they? No, I don't see anything. No. Yeah, um, as I haven't checked the Twitter handle in the last couple of days. But so uh, Docker put out an announcement that they're not going to have physical Docker cons, but they are going to do a virtual Docker con. So it'll be an online event where I'm assuming that we'll have sessions and people will, you know, like maybe maybe we'll all get to talk. Maybe we'll, we'll get to do our Docker con thing in a virtual way. So I hope that's what's going to happen. But uh, we'll have to see, uh, wait for more announcements on that here coming soon. Otherwise, we're all just going to have to meet up at other container conferences, which is now every conference. Um, the interesting thing about, I think, when Gene Luke and I got started was DockerCon was one of the first conferences. Uh, the, it was the first conference that talked specifically about Docker containers, because obviously it was Docker. But eventually, every other conference started covering containers, and then Kubernetes came on the scene. Now, Kubernetes has its own conference that's huge. Uh, what was it like twelve thousand people this year? Did, did you go? Did you were you able to make it? Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, it was huge. Wait, yeah. wait. I mean, a lot of tracks, a lot of information. I I also used to watch like the video on YouTube because you can really go over all the one you are willing to see. So, yeah, I have a list, like a, a list that will keep me busy until the next KubeCon. 
Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, my watching list keeps growing every day, so I would never catch up. Yeah. So, uh, I what what we're talking about is if you search here on YouTube, uh, it, I don't think it's the CNC and F CNCF channel. I don't think it's a KubeCon channel, but there's a CNCF channel where all well, or most of the KubeCon videos are available, and that's hundreds, I think, uh, definitely over a hundred videos. Um. And you can do all that learning. So if you need to learn, because you can't make it to KubeCon, like this is the next best thing. Obviously, I always talk about that we need to go to conferences to talk to, to people and actually hang out with and learn people from people. But uh, the learning is obviously why a lot of people go. But I like to see my yeah, friends. It's also, a very, it's also a very good way to have some training because, uh, because you know, the, the conference venue are usually so big that you have to work like for minutes to go from a, a room to another. So it's a good way to, you know, yeah, walk. <laughs> yeah, and and if you've done this long enough, like you keep seeing, like there's a there's a circuit that all of us speakers <laughs> have. So you constantly see people you know because you've either you you know they've spoken at a different conference that you've been at, or you maybe even spoke with them. Um, if you do this long enough, I I don't know. Uh, did you speak at KubeCon this year? I don't remember. Uh, no, I spoke at DockerCon. Yeah, which is enough. Yeah. <laughs> That that's good enough. Yeah, <laughs> we have yeah. we had some fun there. So <laughs> it's always nice to go to a conference and not have to work at the conference and just be able to learn and uh, see your friends and stuff. So, yeah, cool. What's your next conference? Uh, I'm gonna be in Lithuania for DevOps Pro Europe. So it's uh, I, my first time there. So I never been to Lithuania even. So it's gonna be fun. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to speak about continuous profiling uh, in Go. So, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, continuous profiling. So, what... All right, so for those that... Because there are some people on this channel, like myself, that aren't hardcore developers. What does profiling uh, really do for us? Um, yeah, let's say that you have a running application. Uh, let's think about Go. So, you have a binary and you start it and you have to know how the runtime is performing. So um, which function are taking um, more memory than what they should take, or which function is uh, taking all the CPU, and so on. So the idea to, is that you have to get this information out from the binary. And uh, profiling is the tool you are looking for. So there are profilers for a lot of different languages. Um, I used one in PHP, and the one that I'm working on uh, right now is Go. And Go exposed a um, profiling tool called Profefe, uh, sorry, Pproof, and um, you can expose it via HTTP. So every time you call an HTTP handler, you get a um, profile back. And you can store this profile, uh, for example, has a uh, tarball. And the idea is that you can read it and analyze it later when you need it. So let's say that you have a bunch of application running and one of them, is, and you see uh, looking at your dashboard or you get an alert about from, like, from one of those because it's getting like 80% of the CPU for the server and it is not supposed to do it. So what do you do next? Um, you can get a profile and you can visualize it and you can ask for the top five offender function in uh, memory order. So you would get the top five functions that are using more, more memory in, in the life cycle of your binary. Um, and the problem is that you never know when you are going to need this profile. Maybe you will need it when you are in front of your laptop. So you can do the sealed command and you can get the tarball and analyze it later. But sometimes, or really often, uh, you are not in front of your laptop. Um, or even if you are, you're doing your work and you don't know that you're going to have a memory or CPU issue. Um, so the idea here is to have an infrastructure that continuously take those um, profiles for you and take them, in, take them all in order and manageable via API. So you can get them, uh, you can filter them based on, I don't know, the host name or based on the binary name. Or if you are a Kubernetes guy, you can filter them by pod name or based on the service name that you have um, for, the, for the container. Um, and when you have all those profiles, you can 
merge them together in a specific time range and ask for those information. So that's mainly um, the topic here. And uh, there is a open source project called Profefe that is made by um, Vladimir, that is a is maintainer. Um, I discovered that and I found it was very cool. Um, so I, because it serves like an API layer that you can use to push and retrieve profiles. Uh, other than that, just for the fact that we use Kubernetes a lot internally at Influx Data, uh, I took the chance to write a um, small bridge between Kubernetes and Profefe. So what is called a cube Profefe, because I'm very original. It's <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, it's either gonna you're either gonna call it Kube or Ka's Profefe. So <laughs> one of those choices, right? You you don't have a lot. Um, That's true, and yeah. I thought about that intensively. And I yeah, did Cube. This time. Yeah, Cube. <laughs> or is it Kube? <laughs> <laughs> how do you pronounce? How do you pronounce your Cube? <laughs> I think hey, yeah, that's, that's even another yeah stuff to guess. So uh, yeah, I mean this is, it's a very simple collector. So I run it as a cron job in my Kubernetes cluster and based on the annotation on, of, on your pod. Uh, as you can see, there is the annotation like enable is equals true that tells uh, the collector that, that that pod has a profile and that can be grabbed. Uh, and you can also put the service name and the service name is just an identifier that you can use to filter profiles later uh, when you're retrieving them. And you can use port and path to configure where to grab those profiles. And there is also a QCTL plugins that gives you a little bit more capabilities about um, retrieving and filtering and pushing profiles. Yeah, that's um, cool. Yeah, makes it easier. Yeah, 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 definitely. And when you you know you can capture them via locally from your QCTL and store them into Profefe or store them lo locally, or you can have this uh, cron job that runs and keeps them. Uh, and download them. For example, at, at Influx, we get profiles from all the pods every 10 seconds, and we store them into Profefe. Um, we sample them later, or we delete them when they are too old, like over three months. Wow. Yeah, this is really cool. So uh, yet another example of taking something that we traditionally did by hand, right? Like uh, capturing a profile was painful, <laughs> and now it's essentially a cube control command line. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm driven by my, my boringness, so uh, my laziness, let's say. So when something makes me too bored or I'm too lazy to do it, I just tend to uh, try to automate it. So I was very um, like bored by my colleagues asking me or the SRE team to get profiles. So I thought, OK, I'm going to give them a way to do it by themselves. So I would do something. Uh, you know, more useful for the company or for myself. You know, I work from home, so sometimes I take a walk or I do gardening. So it's good to have time. Yeah, and I mean, it seems like a, a, your your theme uh, for a while now has been around um, testing, extending, uh, basically focusing on making the tooling around your dev experience in containers easier. It's, uh, you've yeah. been on that, that yeah, trip for a while. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a very good trip. And uh, uh, what I like about it is that it, it gives me the um, opportunity to uh, speak with people uh, and not with tools or technology. So uh, the most important stuff we had to fix as an um, engineer is the workflow uh, that our team or our company needs to have or develop. Um, fortunately for us, we have a lot of those um, APIs exposed by tools that we use every day. So even Docker, Docker, everybody does Docker has a CLI and it runs command and it pushed images. But behind that tiny Docker CLI, there is a word uh, that you can use and you can, um, you know, incorporating your application or incorporating your framework to do something even better even cooler than Docker runs, that is already very cool. So, <laughs> um, and that's what I, I try to do. You know, I tend to think about the workflow or how uh, my colleagues uh, are happy or should work. And um, um, I glue together softwares that uh, helps me to get there. 
Um, so yeah, and uh, what I you know what I'm doing with Kubernetes and what I did with, with Prophet Pefe or what I did with test containers um, goes along these lines. So test containers is a, a organization, let's say, that has a bunch of different projects on different languages. So you can see the Go one, but uh, the main one is in Java. Uh, I discovered it when I was uh, working on uh, Zipkin, that it's a, a popular tracer, um, and they use uh, test containers Java to do their integration tests. Yeah, and it's a very—I mean, it's a very easy uh, but you know uh, useful uh, tool. You can programmatically configure uh, your mm, the environment your test needs inside the test itself with real code. And I'm, I come from a developer development background before even doing DevOps or SRE. Um, so I like code and I think code is powerful. Um, and um, you know, the ability to um, programmatically, as I said, write and spin up your environment uh, gives you the ability to orchestrate it in a better way and uh, to monitor it in a better way and to wait for uh, your underlying services and databases to be up and running um, in a, with much more control and granularity. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking about it in mind comparing with uh, Docker Compose because that's usually how I saw people uh, doing um, integration tests in CI. So there was, they had a YAML that Docker Compose that brings up all the dependencies, and uh, in some way they have to wait for the, all the services to be up and running. And uh, this process can be flaky and can drive to uh, confusion or a long wait uh, strategy that maybe is not needed. Uh, but if your container is inside uh, your test, uh, you have much more granularity. So for example, in, in test containers, we have something called wait strategy. So when you declare, when you ask for a container, uh, you can uh, declare what you what to wait for. So you can wait for a log to appear in the stream, or you can wait for a port to be open, or you can wait for a HTTP request to be uh, to succeed or to get an error or whatever, because you are in the code, so you can write whatever you are looking for. And it's reusable, so you can create a function that spin out a bunch of containers and um, you know the and we use the Docker socket, the Docker TCP API. Uh, so for us, what the, what this container does is uh, be focused on the workflow, be focused on the API that developers are uh, usually happy um, to use when they write tests. And I think it's very it's a very powerful mindset. So. Yeah, I'm just I'm seeing how much activity there is on the Java one. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, used a lot. Um, very cool. Yeah. Uh, have you talked yeah. about? I feel like you've done a talk on test containers. That was my talk at DockerCon. Okay. Yeah. So they can probably Google. Yeah. I, they, yeah. yeah, they can Google write um, write maintainable integration tests uh, on YouTube, and there is my my talk there. There is also a blog post in the Docker uh, website about it. Oh. Um, so I'm yeah I'm trying to write whatever I you know new release or new features. Um, the way I'm so passionate about it is because when I discovered the test containers Java uh, version, I decided to port it in Go because I work every day in Go. Um, so I'm currently one of the maintainers for the uh, Go uh, version of the library. Right. I'm I'm looking up your. Uh... Writing maintainable integration tests. Yeah, you know, you can you can even uh, with even with uh, Go or Java. Obviously, the capabilities for those libraries depends on the language that you are using. So some libraries has a better coverage. Other libraries are younger and has less features. But for example, the I have experience with Java and Go, and both of them, for example, supports build. Uh, so you can build your image inside your test. So let's say that you have a, you need to test uh, your code with a specific set of version for your MySQL database because you have some tricks and some stuff that you have to do with different MySQL databases. 
what you can do is you can build those um, MySQL databases images uh, in your tests and reuse them uh, as you need it with the configure you need it with the you know models you have you have to use and so on. Um, so it these uh, these methodologies uh, really gives you all the flexibility that you you need. So that's that's what I'm I'm very happy about. Yeah, I put the links to that stuff in chat. So if you're watching this on YouTube, um, the link to Docker's blog is on there. It's titled, um, let's see, Write Maintainable Integration Tests with Docker. And then the uh, Gianluca's YouTube video for DockerCon 2019 uh, on the same topic is also uh, put into chat. So, you. you know, there's a, there's a lot, uh, it's amazing I still think how many companies I run into that are doing very little to no testing on production code. It, it, it's one of those things where we don't really talk about it in the industry very much because we, we we feel like a lot of us that go to conferences and stuff, we're always sort of on the leading edge of things. And it's a, it's a, in a lot of those circles, it's assumed, right? It's assumed you're testing. <laughs> it assumes you're, yeah, you're CI totally. testing it. Yeah, it's also very different how do we write application compared with you know a few years ago. We you know when I started to work, every uh, almost everybody was uh, speaking about unit tests, um, and we had to mock stuff and we had to uh, you know iterate on those unit tests, uh, keep the mocks up to date and so on. Uh, and I think it's reasonable. It's great. I I love to write unit tests and I think you should do it. So I, I'm not advertising about uh, against that. Uh, you should have both, but those days we write code that has a lot more integration with external services because we write microservices. So we are always reaching to something that may fail or may change, and integration tests are available to um, test with a real application. So you have you need to have both uh, in place, and the fact that we can have an easy way to create to spin up those environment. Um, we we'll I, I hope we we'll simplify um, the 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 job of writing those tests, so we will write more of them, more stable, and so on. Um, so yeah, that that's definitely something that needs to be developed, an habit that needs to be developed. And I think that's why testing frameworks are very, um, you know, it, they are very a silver bullet. When you have a good one, you can cover all your application in an easy way and make it very solid. Yeah. Um, there, there's not a lot of people out there that are passionate about talking about testing. So uh, I think for all developers everywhere, I would like to thank you for all of your efforts <laughs> to make Anytime. it easier in containers. Because I think, yeah, I think it's one of the big things is we, when people move to containers, they, the, the, te the CI part, it's one thing to get up the, inf the infrastructure set up and then to learn that, okay, I need to now test in containers. But to get that as streamlined and as automated as it, as it was before you had containers, it typically takes teams a while to figure all those, you know, integrations out. How do the how do these apps talk to each other when they're now in separate containers? And that there's a lot going on there. And how do I capture the logs out of my my testing and you know for storing in the other systems later? It, there's so many different issues there that uh, the projects I work on they that they come they hit all related to testing infrastructure that usually. Especially if you ha if you have old code that's been around a while, like you could you could easily have like a decade worth of Jenkins scripts <laughs> that you have to figure <laughs> out how do I make all of these now work in containers. So yeah, I think it's also like as you said, uh, con Docker and containers really change how we do CI. So I think it's uh, a lot of a lot of companies now has uh, or runs uh, builds inside a container. So usually they do it like doing Docker in Docker. So your be, your container where you run the test already has Docker in some way reachable. So as soon the onboarding for a library like test containers will be like just one second because the Docker socket is already there, the API is already reachable. So you just need to you know start to use it. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's hop on this other thing I want to talk about. The extending Kubernetes report. So O'Reilly has this free report that you wrote. Uh, if anyone wants to get it, I'm going to throw the link into chat. Um, tell me about uh, what's in this report, rather than me just reading the web page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, as I said, I'm very um, 
into the idea that you should do a lot more with the tools you are using. So we use a lot of like dependencies or services like Kubernetes or Sentry for our errors or Datadog or whatever for our monitorings. And all those services serves API. And when you are able to glue them together to solve the workflow you uh, are willing to use to be successful, um, you will really feel the power of all of those um, uh, tools. So I, when, I, when we work with Kubernetes, I tend to remember that. So I know that Kubernetes, one of the um, like important and great features I think Kubernetes has is its ability to be an API gateway. So Kubernetes, other than be a very like solid scheduler, a very good um, scalability tool, so an orchestrator for your containers, it's also an API gateway because it gives you an API that you can use um, and you use every day with the QCTL. Um, this book is about how to use the hook point that Kubernetes gives you um, to do something that really is what uh, you need in your company. And it's really hard, uh, from my experience, to take a project from the outside, like the one I did, like the take Profefe and say, OK, I'm going to use Cube Profefe now. Um, in my opinion, it's very hard to onboard a project and to make it successful in a different context. Because every context, every team, every company has already its own um, set of services, set of pipelines, set of mindsets and tools that it uses. Um, so the fact that you move your uh, mindset from using the tool to developing it um, in your uh, tools that you use every day um, makes a difference. So Kubernetes can really be the center uh, for it because it has a very powerful authentication method so you can have different contexts and you can manage different, um, you know, Kubernetes cluster, and you have a uh, QCTL, and uh, you can write QCTL plugins that really works similar to how the Docker plugin uh, works. So if you know about the Docker CLI, you can write uh, plugins for it as well. And the way it works for the QCTL is just the, you need a binary uh, that has a name like QCTL dash something. And as soon as you place this binary inside your path, uh, you can call it via kubectl, uh, like kubectl blah, 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 with the name of the, uh, you, gave, you gave to the binary. Um, so in this super easy way, you already have, you already merging workflow for the end user. So you made all the effort to install Kubernetes, to onboard your teams, uh, your teammate and your company on using these gigantic tools. And when you need a small automation scripts, uh, you open bash and you do your bash scripts. Um, this for me is very unportable, very hard to onboard and to share. Um, yeah. So other than doing that, what you can do is just to write a kubectl, um, Kubernetes CTL plugin. So you will just ask your colleagues to download it and you will be sure to have a you know a friendly workflow that doesn't require a context switch because the qctl is the entry point and you know that it's there so this book contains tricks and hooks for kubernetes that you can use during your daily work to um, run small applications or even big application that um, that leverage kubernetes api um, those hooks are um, custom resource definition. So when you do kubectl get pod, pod is a resource, but you can have custom resource definition. So let's say that you are um, you are you know you you are using uh, root 53 in AWS, and you can use the Amazon CLI and do and create your resource, or you can uh, go and click on the Amazon CLI uh, on Amazon UI to create a new DNS record, or you can create a custom resource definition called uh, root 53 uh, DNS record or whatever. And you can do kubectl create root, root 53 DNS record. And you are bringing a very far away API um, into the Kubernetes workflow. And what it means 
it means that you have the authentication mechanism provided by Kubernetes because Kubernetes has its authentication method. So the cubes, you can say, okay, uh, those three people in the team ops can create um, root 53 DNS record because I give to them the permission, but uh, the development team can only visualize them. And you can do it without uh, just creating the custom result definition and leveraging the, what Kubernetes uh, brings you. So authentication, authorization, audit logs, um, and so on. So it's, you know, and custom result definition are just one entry point, one hooks for Kubernetes. QCTL are another one, QCTL plugins are another one, but uh, there are also shared informers. So you can um, watch for events happening inside Kubernetes, like pod creation, or service deletion, or replica set scale, and so on. And you can do stuff based on those events. So there are a lot of them. Even you know th that report is like um, maybe 35, 40 pages, but it can be like way longer. Right. It could be a book. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a book. It could be a course, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, it was a conversation I was just having uh, in a local uh, local community Slack that we have. People were talking about containers and the operator SDK that I think CoreOS puts out. And then people were talking about um, basically all the different SDKs and helper tools to get you started on customizing every part of Kubernetes, right? And uh, whether it's the command line or it's extending the API itself or, yeah. And, and it's cool that the, the the biggest challenge now is which which ones are you going to use and which ones are you going to not use and I, I feel like at this point we're going to get into a situation where there is so much going on that it it's I'm afraid that it's going to cause Kubernetes and like your setup to be a little bit rigid and maybe not necessarily fragile but you know if you've got so many plugins and so many API tools and all these different operators that you've added in your cluster, um, now you have to test everything with every new version, right? It's uh, yeah, it's gonna become WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope not. Let's hope not. Uh, but you know, it's 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 infectious. To I mean, once you start extending Kubernetes and you realize how how much it can adapt to your workflow with just a little bit of effort, it. Um, it's easy, I think, to go overboard. And one of the challenges I have with with uh, projects, which I think just containers in general, because now what we're dealing with, right, is Docker started with this API of, oh yeah, you can. It would be like it would be like if you know System D or any standard system process manager defaulted to having an H, a REST based API, right? And now suddenly. We're, th this is now the default. And now we all assume if you're going to create a systems or a cluster or cloud management tool, it's going to have some sort of API to it. And we're all going to be able to use that, um, presuming it's, it's REST. The, the challenge now is like, okay, every one of your de tools depends on versions of every one of your tools. And you ended up in this weird scenario where I, you can't change anything because it's all dependent on certain versions. I ran into this today, uh, this morning actually, because... Uh, Docker Desktop is on Kubernetes 115. Uh, Minikube is defaults to doing 117, and the command line is only supposed to go. I think it's one version above or below, right? And so Cube Control is complaining on my machine, and now I have to worry about versioning my Cube Control command line for which cluster I'm working on. <laughs> which yeah. I, there's tools to help me with that, and it, we all start going down this road. I think of wanting all the buttons we want all the features and the toggles and the things and then pretty soon we find out that uh nothing can move forward and i'm I'm worried about that i i don't lose sleep at night about it but uh, it's a concern yeah, of I mine mean, I, that, that's why i think we should really be focused on the workflow over than everything else like the tools and the operators and kubernetes and docker are utilities to get to your fl workflow your workflow in the fastest and uh, most friendly and usable way uh, you can think about. But, you know, they can come and go, they can become too complex or not enough complex, but your, your workflow will always be, uh, you know, easy to understand or possible to figure out. 
Um, and if you have, no, I think that API, APIs really gives you this flexibility, is the layer of flexibility. Um, you can glue them and use them and change them even uh, without, without really changing the end workflow. Obviously, right. if you keep yourself and you lock yourself into the Docker CLI or in the kubectl CLI without thinking about why you're using it, you will never be able to, um, you know, change it or it will be a very big effort because you have to change your mindset and mindsets are way too hard to, to, to change that uh, tools. So if you, if you can get over the, the, the tool yeah. and think about what we are using the tool for, um, maybe it will be also easy to fix some of those concerns. Yeah. Well, and I think saying no. Um, I mean, <laughs> obviously these, like, these tools are all great, um, but at some point uh, with other tools, not, not your tools, but with other tools, uh, at some point we have to say, okay, just because I can doesn't mean I necessarily should because now if, I, if I'm adding in some sort of integration, this is potentially going to be a problem later. For everything, everything we put into production or, or put on our machine as part of our workflow is now something we have to maintain, right? And I think we easily forget that. And I, I now have to care about versions. I just dealt with this the other day because I was working on a project. I, I have a Ghost blog and uh, I was... I'm back and forth between using Ghost in containers and then Ghost itself has this command line utility that's not in a container that you can use locally to easily manage your blog setup. And uh, But that particular localized non-Docker version cares about your node version on your machine. And I haven't had to care about node versions on my machine in years. Like, you know, we've been lucky that for years now, even the, the, the unstable releases of node have been good enough at providing their feature set that on your local dev machine, for just local utility use, you never had to worry about it. If you if you care about a specific version, you run it in Docker. So I started running, I started trying these local command line tools out, and I immediately started hitting all these dependency problems with my local setup. And I thought, this is why I love Docker. Like I never had to worry about this in Docker. I should just stop and go back to Docker. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, our, our our machines, just like our servers, can get fragile the more we add on them. Um, so I don't think Docker necessarily had that. Uh, problem because we didn't we didn't try to add so much complexity on top of Docker in terms of its API as we're now doing with Kubernetes, um, uh, and the Kubernetes API while it's stable and there are versions so that's good and they're changing l slower over time and that's good we've got stability checks um, that are a little bit better than three or four years ago when it was a little wild wild west. Um, but yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm waiting for us to have this show where we, we in a year where we talk about how do you move your how do you upgrade your Kubernetes cluster when you have <laughs> 25 operators and 10 plugins on the command line that you need and yeah it gets a little crazy. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be yeah it's gonna be a mess. That's why we need to be pragmatic. So we need to really think deeply about what we are installing, why we are installing it, yeah. and always like thinking about not an escape route because we will always, you know, we can escape from everything. So at some point we will have to pick something. Uh, but, you know, having in mind that um, it's a tool and it can change and we need to be flexible on it and accept that. But yeah, yeah I think, you know, even Kubernetes, the Kubernetes ecosystem is gigantic. And when you look at it, you know, w without having your target or without, you know, having your star to follow, um, it can become really, really complicated. But as soon as you have a real, um, you know, a real use case or something, a real environment where you start to have constraints, uh, because you start to know, you start to know that you have to use AWS. So you start to cut everything that is not AWS related, um, and you start to see that you are gonna scale. You are not gonna scale over like you know, uh, five clusters with a thousand nodes. So you're gonna move, uh, you know, even deeper, or you know, you're gonna move out what doesn't bring you there. So at some point, you 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 need to be good at cutting, as you say, to say no and to say yes only to what uh, brings you to the end goal. Otherwise, you know, thinking about the deep ecosystem all the time uh, will won't give you won't bring you to the end goal. Yeah. Well, on the on that topic. Um, in all of your working with uh, extending Kubernetes and and the testing tools, is there something that 
is is there is there something built into these SDKs where before you upgrade a cluster, because uh, I've not run into this where I've had to test a bunch of different uh, like plugins and operators and CRDs and stuff like that. Is there something that allow that I, is out there that allows us to other than just installing it on a new version of a cluster and seeing if it works? Is there a, a testing framework for that in the SDKs? Um, yeah, there is, and that's a very good question <laughs> because. <laughs> Yeah, there is a project that is called Kind, mm -hmm. and and it it stays for uh, Kubernetes inside Docker, um, so that's that's what it is, and it is developed by the um, uh, Kubernetes uh, SIG uh, testing, and this is what they use to um, run tests on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so as you can see, it is a um, um, is a CLI, but even better it is a library that you can embed in your code. Obviously, the library is in Go. Okay. So if you are working with another like uh, application, it will be, it, another language, it will be a little bit more complicated. Uh, but I, I tried, and I think I will get back to it um, at some point. Um, I tried to embed it in, uh, um, in test container. So in, you, can, you can use the same you know, flavor to start one Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but yeah, the idea is that when you, you know, if you look at it, uh, you see that there are uh, functions that you in Go that you can use to create cluster. And when you create cluster, you can get the kubectl client. And from there, you have a client that you can pass through your function and test it over. Um, so you can also, you can, when you create a cluster, a test, uh, kind cluster, you can, as you can see, you can specify the node uh, version. Uh, the the image is just the Kubernetes uh, version, so you can spin up more more of them and run your your test function over multiple version of um, of Kubernetes. It's a very good way. It's a solid way because it is used by uh, Kubernetes itself. So it's not a you know toy project that somebody did. Uh, but the purpose for it was to make the pipeline for Kubernetes uh, more flexible. And uh, I think I have some spare code, but I don't, I, can, I don't remember what it is. So I, maybe, I will maybe follow up with you so you can share it uh, later. But I tried to uh, make a test that spin up some containers with test contain with um, kind and you know, send um, a bunch of requests to, see, um, to, to, uh, to check this and do assertion on the output. So I think that's a very good way to do testing in Kubernetes if, you, if you're using go if yeah. you are not using it i i don't know <laughs> i can't yeah. i can't excuse it in well yeah i was gonna say i mean i guess at least you you could i mean if you're if you're testing in something like docker compose or if you're testing already in uh kubernetes then you, you know this this stuff runs as containers so you wouldn't be able to do it in the same library but you could at least cross do it cross container that's something yeah um, yeah oh definitely yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 you can always you know run yeah run the kind Command has a exec in every language, so you can do OS exec whatever in your test. It would work. Uh, you can also create more container, more more, more clusters uh, with different names, so you can look up them by name in your test. You know, the, the, those kind of issues, those kind of mindset are the one that I'm trying to like the test containers removes, because you don't need to have, you don't need to think about all those stuff like having an isolated environment for every test anymore because it is all managed by the fact that you are creating the environment inside your test. Right. So every test has its own one. And you can also do parallelization. That is a very um, you know, good way to decrease the, um, the, you know, how long the, the CI takes to run. That is usually a very big concern when you do integration tests because it can get slow quickly. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's another challenge. Uh, parallelization is also a tough challenge, but uh, probably a topic for another day. Um, yeah. All right, so we have talked a lot about all the cool projects that Gianluca is working on, and now I think it's time to look at some questions. I've been scanning the question list. Um, I'm just going to throw some out here. I'm going to skip around. I'm not going to really go in order. <laughs> um <laughs> So there was a conversation here. Uh, 
these aren't all related to our topics, but I'll talk about it anyway. Um, Biker's asking, uh, I want, I want Docker Desktop for my whole team, but this gives me pause about recommending. I run Swarm mode every few months. Docker will crash and requires reset the factory default on the Mac. When I try this, it goes into an infinite loop of Docker needs privileged access. I can't get past this point. I even uninstalled Docker desktop completely and reinstalled the fresh download. Okay. So uh, one, why can't, <laughs> it's a long question. Why can't I completely remove Docker on Mac? Um, I do not know. I recommend reaching out to me in the, or one of us in the Docker community Slack and we can help you with a bug report and getting the, you know, getting at least some sort of response from maybe the team. If you're, if this is happening across multiple Macs, like if it's something on your Mac, I've never had this problem. So I don't know if Gianluca, I think you're on a Mac, right? Are you on Linux? No, I'm a Linux guy. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you don't have these problems, but um, <laughs> I have I, other problems. So I don't have sounds. I don't have webcam. I don't have a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you got problems. You got you got drivers. You got drivers. Uh, um, so yeah, I, I don't think this is systemic. Obviously, there's millions of people using Docker Desktop, so I'm not. I wouldn't be too concerned uh, that it's some sort of fundamental problem with Docker Docker Desktop. Um, so yeah, so we can help with that. Uh, I think just reach out to me either in the Docker Community Slack or in the Docker Mastery Slack or somewhere else, and I can give you some advice on what to do about that. Number two, what causes this? I've not seen this problem, so I don't know. How do I prevent? I've asked Docker support several times, but now with Mirantis, it is useless as they won't, as they don't support Docker. Um, so you can try. So Docker Desktop. This is a couple of things we should point out. Docker Desktop, which is kind of related because it does do Kubernetes, and it's what I use all day for Kubernetes. But um, let's see. It's GitHub.com/slash/docker/slash/4Mac. All right, so if you're, I don't know if this is the support you're talking about, but the four Mac um, repo is where you can put in issues. Obviously, there's lots of issues there, but if you ping me in there at Brett Fisher and you give really good details on recreating this issue, we can try to recreate it, um, see what happens. Um, yeah, so no problem. Uh, we can help. All right, next question. I think that was kind of related to the Docker Mirantis split. So people were actually started talking about that. Uh, I wanted to address that because we did talk about this in November. You can go back to, in this channel, to a November show all about the Docker split and find all the details about what's basically the, the rule is, is that all the, the open source stayed with Docker and all of the private closed sourced, you know, paid products went with Mirantis. So, Docker Desktop stayed with Docker, Docker Engine, Docker Compose, Docker Swarm, all of those things stayed with Docker. And Mirantis is still selling the enterprise suite, which includes Docker Engine, the UCP and DTR and all that, and Swarm and Kubernetes that's built in. The official statement from uh, Mirantis is that they'll provide at least two years of support for Swarm, but the Swarm team is one person and we don't really know yet if Mirantis is providing them more people or more time to work on Swarm. So at this point, if you're on Swarm, there's no reason to leave Swarm. And if you like Swarm, keep using it. Like two years is a long time. We, you know, I'm not, I'm not, what's changed for me is I'm not going to clients and then telling them they should implement Swarm as a new project. Um, if they've already got it, I'm not telling them to leave. It works great. We've got years of paid support and then hey, maybe the community will pick it up after that and just keep it you know, relatively bug-free. So we don't know yet. I'm in a holding pattern, I think, like the rest of us. Uh, I don't know if, Gene, Luca, if you have a different thought on that. Oh, I just do the same. So what runs, runs. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to even have a company that says they're going to provide paid support for an open source project because most don't. So I already look at it as like, this is better than most open source projects, which are always in some sort of... Is the is the maintainer going to give up <laughs> after I implement this tool? Like that happens a lot with yeah. the tools. At least I, I feel like I use. Um, so yeah, uh, a Swarm is open source. It's called Swarm Kit. Uh, it's part of the Docker engine, which is also open source. It's it's basically added in as a library into the Docker engine. So when you type in Docker 
Swarm init, that's technically using a library underneath called SwarmKit. That's all open source. So you can just look up SwarmKit on GitHub and you can add issues. You can see the PRs that are happening. Um, a little bit of work still ha still happening in that repo. So let's, let's hope that it stays around because there are tons of us, including a lot of Docker captains that like it for its ease of use and for simple, small things. We, we talk a lot about Kubernetes and of course, since I've just launched two different Kubernetes courses in the last six months, I talk a lot about Kubernetes now, but that doesn't mean that these tools are like a panacea. Like every tool has its uses. So a common question here is on which one to use. And I would say go buy one of my courses because I go at length talking about that in Docker Mastery. Yeah, it's, um, also very, it's also easy, very important to remember that um, the experience that we develop and the community develop with Swarm uh, made Kubernetes a better tool because all the join mechanism that uh, Kubernetes now has, that is the one that uh, made the made it easier to use, comes from the Swarm experience and all the you know uh, interfaces like the um, CNI, CS, uh, like the network interface or the container storage interface or the container runtime interface, all comes from this. Um, from the open, so for the, from the fact that there are a lot of different tools, a lot of different developers, a lot of different mindset, a lot of different needs. Um, and so I think it's valuable, it's also very, very valuable to keep it around for that and to leverage these uh, tools and these. Uh, yeah. Code. Yeah, I mean, the Docker engine isn't going anywhere and Swarm is a part of it. So uh, unless Docker, you know, pulled it out, um, at some future date, which I'm, I'm sure that could happen. Um, but it's at this point, it feels unlikely just because th it's there and it works. I wouldn't expect a lot of new features uh, unless, you know, it's one of those things where the, a majority of Docker's enterprise customers were paying to use Swarm and were using Swarm as their orchestrator. They might also be using Kubernetes, but they were, a majority of them were definitely using Swarm even during the split. So if those customers keep paying Mirantis and Mirantis sees that that's a business opportunity, they might consider continuing to use it. So I would say if you're paying for it, definitely reach out to Mirantis and say, hey, we're using Swarm. Don't kill it. <laughs> keep keep adding features. I, I know uh, the team was talking about using jobs or building jobs for it, uh, cron job support, and then also hopefully some better storage support for the, the CSI kind of stuff that Kubernetes uses. So let's hope. Let's hope for that. Um, next question. It's a pretty good one off the wall. What are your views on securing Dockerized Node.js apps using Let's Encrypt SSL? Um, well, Let's Encrypt is great as an SSL opportunity. If you can use Let's Encrypt, uh, not everyone can because of certain requirements, whether that's because it's an internal server and you can't get it remotely accessible from a firewall, you know. Um, but if it's a, if it's an app on the internet, Sure. I wouldn't put Let's Encrypt into Node.js, though. I would use something like Traffic as a front-end proxy to automatically do it for me. Um, you can look up Traffic. Traffic has Let's Encrypt support built in, and it will just go get your certs and provide proxying for the Node.js app, and that's what I would do. I wouldn't... I've never taken a Node.js app and put in Let's Encrypt support into the app itself. I don't know about you. Yeah, what do you think? No, definitely, yeah. yeah all, all these, you know... Um, how sidecar movement when you have your service mesh in front of your application uh, to the couple common patterns uh, and you know make your application slim and you know focus it on your business are great. So definitely uh, use a, you know a proxy and make it smart enough and to own the TLS certification. Yeah. Um, what do you guys normally recommend as a tool to use to spin up Docker machines when you need more nodes in an infrastructure as code sort of deal, Ansible and the like seems a bit overkill? What do you think? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, I it really I, depends on where, yeah, where you, where you are, and if you are in a, you know, CI environment and you have um, like deep, like Jenkins script, you can um, use that. Or, what I can suggest. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on this. Uh, I used to recommend, you know, hey, look, if you're just one person and you're a solo solo DevOps person, solo sysadmin, and you don't have a lot of requirements for exactly how your systems have to run, then Docker Machine. But Docker Machine has limited... It's not getting new features. It's not that it's not supported anymore. They still add fi- fixes. It's uh, The community's gotten a little confused about that because um, there was a, an erroneous post a year or two ago that was misstating that Docker Machine was end of life, but it, it isn't. Um, it's no longer shipped out now. I think it's no longer shipped with Docker Desktop. So I generally d- would only use it for learning and playing around. Um, but if you're going to do infrastructure as code in production, like if you're, that's what you're talking about here, I would absolutely use a tool like Ansible. Maybe not Ansible though, maybe just CloudFormation, or if you're stuck on a, I wouldn't say stuck, if you're lucky enough <laughs> to use just one cloud, which uh, you know, everybody seems to want to use multi-cloud nowadays, but using one is hard enough. Just use their tools if you don't want. Like you're on AWS, use CloudFormation. Just write a YAML file, and you know, I, I tend to use auto scaling groups in AWS. So I would make the machine that I like, and I'd create an AMI from it, and then I would auto scale that if I needed it using Amazon's built-in tools, which you can all do in CloudFormation, and you. If you don't want to have to learn another tool like Terraform or Ansible or something like that. But I don't know that there's a tool as easy as Docker Machine that does production quality servers. Because Docker Machine, um, you know, you can't choose. It's not, it's, I think it's limited to the OSs that you can use. And you can't exactly do things like uh, install other things on your machine, right? Uh, it only does Docker. It only, it only installs Docker. Um so if you need anything else on there from a security perspective, um, you know you can't. It's, it's hard to do that. You can't. Yeah, I also suggest you to to have a to have a look at cloud in it or uh, in Slicer or whatever. Um, I at Influx we have a SaaS called Influx Cloud uh, when we develop, when we serve Influx DB when we, when we sell Influx DB as a service. And uh, it's all based on cloud init. So even if we spin up like continuously AC2, uh, like really a lot of them, um, we don't use provisioning tools. Everything is just in the cloud init and it's, it's an immutable you know, mindset. So when something go, needs to change, we replace it and the cloud init scripts do uh, whatever needs to be done. Uh, so it installs Dockers, it even installs and joins Kubernetes clusters, Kubernetes nodes uh, with the master. Um, so as, as Brett suggested, with the cloud in it has, at the end, uh, is probably one of the like best workflow in terms of uh, simplicity and efficiency. Uh, so use whatever um, pro- like whatever tools uh, your provider gives you, or worst case, you, or even best case, whatever uh, you can use Terraform because uh, it works across providers, and you can always write the one that fits your needs if you don't have uh, one available um, and you know, create your autoscalers or whatever they are called in your environment and use a tiny clouding script to uh, make the uh, final steps to what you are looking for. Even if it is installing Docker or installing Docker and installing Kubernetes and joining Kubernetes or even just downloading a old fancy uh, MySQL daemon and start me. Um, you don't really need Ansible for those if your uh, application is um, easy enough. Yeah. And one of the things I should say is that, uh, unless this is just a personal project, the last thing I'll say here is uh, infrastructure as code, you want to use a tool that everyone else is using because, you know, one of the things around DevOps is that, you know, cross training, getting other people in your team to uh, be able to easily understand your workflow and the tools you're using from you know the repos you're I mean, because if your infrastructure is code presumably it's in git and it's in something like github or bitbucket or something so you you don't necessarily want to go after some obscure tool out there that you know might work but only a few people are using because that's going to make it much harder for you to collaborate in your team for you to have a replacement it may take over your job so that you can do something cooler or funner, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm always concerned about that with the projects I'm on is when I leave or when they no longer want to pay me, what, you know, who's going to take this over and how can we have a continuity of service? So tools like Ansible CloudFormation, Terraform, those tools are very popular. 
I'd say that probably at this point, tool uh, tools like Chef and Puppet, while they had their day, I, I don't personally see them a lot in container-focused projects. Uh, not that they're not great tools for infrastructure, but I would say those are more complicated to, to deal with and a little bit harder. And of course, I might be dating myself because it's been years since I've really used them. A little bit harder to do pure infrastructure as code with them without setting up infrastructure to manage the infrastructure. So um, I think, I don't know, I think I really think that at the end of the day, like the simplest thing you can do is whatever cloud you're on, use their built-in tools if you if you want. Like everybody has them, all of the clouds have them. And if you just don't want to have to learn another one, uh, that would be what I'd do. The, there's a good question on does Kube, well, we talked about Compose a little bit earlier, does Kubes use a Compose file like the one in Swarm? Uh, it can with a Docker project called Compose on Kubernetes. Have you used this before? I saw it, but I never used it. Yeah. No. Well, you're technically, uh, we can all use it. So if you have Docker Desktop installed, uh, which someone asked if you have Docker Desktop for Linux, so that doesn't exist. Mostly Docker's response to that is that there is very few people that on Linux requesting Docker Desktop in terms of scaling to the millions of people on Windows and Mac. So Windows is by far the most popular developer platform. Um, like when I take when I look at my course statistics, you know, way more than 50% of the people taking my courses are on Windows and that's over 100,000 people. So I feel like it's, you know, I got a good, I got a good survey there of the people taking the courses and, and the majority of them are on Windows. So if you presume that that's the same thing for Docker Desktop, then the, the percentage of Docker people, Docker desktop people that would be on Linux would be less than 10% of the total. So that's a, not a lot of users to create a whole, no pro, a whole new product for. But hey, there's a lot of it's open source, so you could you could work on something. Um, all right, so the, the Kube on Compose thing. So this is a repo called Compose on Kubernetes, and it's built into your Docker desktop. That's why I was mentioning Docker desktop. Uh, it's already an on, so you can technically use Docker stack deploy dash dash, I think it's orchestrator equals Kubernetes or something like that. And you can deploy a compose file to a Kubernetes cluster on your local machine if you have Kubernetes enabled. You can also now deploy this tool into a Kubernetes cluster. And it essentially, when you use the Docker commands, will take that compose file, translate it into Kubernetes API resource specifics and implement it. Now, the the positive here is that it allows you to have one single file for dev, test, and prod if you use all the Docker tooling. This is also enabled, I believe, by default in a Docker Enterprise setup. So if you're using Docker Enterprise, you get this out of the box. The negative is that obviously it's Compose. So it doesn't support every possible thing that Kubernetes supports because you know typically my Compose files are one third or one fourth the size of the Kubernetes manifests. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if that's your experience, but... Uh, they're smaller, which means that they're going to support less. So not all the features are there. Yeah, I never use it. I remember when they presented it at DockerCon, uh, it was that the audience was very like happy about it. And I think it's, there are so many Docker Compose files around that it's good to have an easy way to um, try them on Kubernetes. Uh, but I'm not sure if in long, long running. Uh, you know, you can always uh, write Docker Compose, apply it uh, in this way, and export it back when you are confident enough about your your uh, Kubernetes skills. Yeah, that's maybe another way to go. Uh, next question: uh, uh, Service meshes are a hot topic. Do you see them being built into orchestrators? No, unless you're talking about distributions. So this gets into the conversation, I think, around what is Kubernetes vanilla upstream? And that project, you know, there's tons of service meshes. <laughs> back in the, that back three or four months ago, there was like multiple service meshes being launched every month. And there's no, there's no you know, consensus on which one is the right one because it's a, high, it's a more opinionated part of the stack. And I don't think there will ever be a default that everyone uses. Like, you know, we all sort of default to Docker still. Uh, you know, 80% of deployments, I think, at KubeCon this year, they said, are, are still using the Docker engine. Um, that'll probably change over time. But it, in this case, I don't think that with Swarm, with us, I'm sorry, with service meshes, that we'll have that kind of consensus. We probably won't have 8 or 90% of people using the same one. So it would be weird to add that one of those uh, to Kubernetes, The you know, because Kubernetes is actually breaking things out. It's actually moving things out of core. 
like all of the you know storage plugins for all the clouds and stuff like that. So they're doing the opposite, not uh, than bundling things in. But if you start talking about distributions, dis, uh, you know different distri- different distributions of Kubernetes like Rancher or Docker Enterprise, those are all potentially, I think, going to add either a not necessarily installed out of the box, but maybe just a click button deployment of different uh, service meshes and kind of like they do with networking and other things that are pluggable into Kubernetes. In fact, I think that's part of what Rio is, which is sort of... Um, yeah, it's a Rancher Lab. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I believe there's a service mesh built in. Is that right? Oh, they changed their page. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it has one built in, and it basically... I think it, I think it has one built in. I think I got now that I see that the architecture I think I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all the yeah, like Linkerd for service mesh and Prometheus for monitoring. So it basically bundles a lot of these add-ons on top of on your on top of your Kubernetes to make it easier for you to deploy apps um, as a higher basically as a higher level of abstraction without needing to decide on every single part of your puzzle. Like, you know, for ingress and like, you know things like canary deployments, auto scaling. So it tries to bundle a lot of that tooling together. So you, I think you're going to see more things like this. But the long answer to the question is no. I don't think. It's going yeah, to be I mean, it, Kubernetes, as we as I said before, it's like it's, you need to think about it as a gateway. So you have to uh, develop your opinion and configure Kubernetes to work as best as it can work in your environment, and uh, uh, you will have a common API that you can leverage to build your stuff on top of it. Uh, but they will probably, I would never force you to uh, use Docker, as they don't force you to use um, F- NFS for storage, or they don't force you to use um, whatever DNS is out there. Uh, the job for Kubernetes is to give you a gateway that you can use and an API that you can leverage. Um, so definitely everybody at some scale will uh, need a service mesh. So the way you inject this service mesh uh, concrete implementation in your environment uh, may be better developed in the future. Uh, but you know, with the Istio operator, uh, there is already an inject um, mechanism, so you, it's very transparent. You don't really need to uh, do a lot to get it running, um, at least injected. Obviously, keep Istio running is complicated and it's a very huge application, but at least um, injecting it as a sidecar for all your application isn't that complicated. So I think they are going to get better on that side, but they are not going to give you the end tool for service mesh uh, ever. Right. Right. Um, all right. I think this is going to be the last question. Uh, very specific one for you. Gianluca, I'm curious what mechanism you use with Cloud and Knit for Swarm and Kube join token storage and acquisition. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that, yeah. Uh, first, I think you can use whatever mechanism you use with Ansible or whatever other tools. Um, the one we use uh, is uh, very raw, so uh, we have uh, we um, cycle uh, join token with a very short, reasonably short CTL. Um, so the join token is the is a string that you have to pass from a Kubernetes node to the Kubernetes master when the node requires to join the cluster. After the join happened, uh, the token doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so we cycle those token and we and we place the token in the cloud init in the join command. Um, and every time we spin up an autoscaler, it uses the join token um, that is temporarily available. Uh, this is what we use. Um, I think there are uh, a thousand other like way to do it, probably in a even more safe or better way. But for us, it was the best compromise we was able to take at the time. Uh, you know, Vault is another one that you can use. That the Ashicorp Vault it is a secret store, but it requires a database and needs to be up and running. So it requires uh, some more effort. Or you can even, you know, if you are in a cloud provider, you can probably use the encryption service in the cloud provider. Yeah. And you can use, you know, Amazon has its own one. 
And the good fact about having all those services in a cloud provider is that they, uh, the security is way more manageable uh, because you know AC2, uh, you can attach roles to AC2 that gives you authentication authorization on services in AWS. So you can say, let's say that you place an encrypted token um, in their vault. Um, your AC2 gets the authentication just for the fact, just because it has a role. So from inside the server, you can pull and decrypt the joint token. But this is probably the, the next version that I would like to see implemented. But for now, um, we have it in the cloud init. Yeah. And we just, we just be sure to have it with a reasonably short TTL. Yeah, it's always tricky. Um, auto rotating keys is always a, it's a project. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. always a project. Follow the show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I I think we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, it's a great number of questions today. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thanks again, Gianluca, for being on the show this week. Uh, hopefully, we yeah. will uh, meet someday on the Alps and ski down some slopes <laughs> together. Um, yeah. Let me know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we just had a conversation about that before the show, and um, and we're gonna ski, not snowboard. That's specific skiing. Yeah. Uh, and you can follow him. His Twitter handle is right below his smiley little face. There, mine's over here. So uh, follow us on Twitter if you want to see more stuff about Docker and containers and Kubernetes and all that stuff. And of course, you can grab all the links in the show notes in our podcast that will come out. I don't know, eventually a couple of weeks, something like that. Um, this will be in a podcast format. You can get the show notes for that all at brettfisher.com slash podcast. And thanks again for being on the show. We'll be back next week. Have a good one.